this chat about uh, supporting neuro neurodiverse students in the classroom. Um, some of you may have been at the FACE talk last week where we were talking a little bit about neurodiversity, mental health, trauma, and the ways that it impacts students and ourselves showing up for learning. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit more about design and delivery of courses, thinking about our neurodiverse students um, and thinking about our neurodiverse selves too sometimes uh, and how we uh, might build things in and uh, and help one another in these situations. Um, I think that most of us are on board with the idea of like, okay, students are here for learning and we need to help them learn. Um, but we don't necessarily know what helps everyone. We're not familiar with everybody's uh, little quirks and needs as learners. Um, and so hopefully talking through this stuff, maybe we'll get some ideas, uh, maybe some things will directly be applicable to your classes, but maybe we'll just start thinking about, um, about what we could do in general. Okay. Oh, come on, baby. There she goes. Okay. So, uh, in the chat, uh, again, I can't read the chat, but I think you all can. Um, if you would please share your name, the department or division that you're coming from, and a little bit about your role and why you're interested in this topic. And then I'm going to figure out if I can see the chat myself. Oh, there's chat. Okay. Can we move her over here? We can. Yay. I figured it out. Good for me. Also, as like a warning, um, whenever I don't use my headset, my dog barks. It's like, you know, we we apparently have agreed to this um, as, as, you know, uh, beings living in the same space. So uh, I will try to mute myself as quickly as possible if that happens. Hopefully it doesn't. They've already picked up the garbage today. So um I, I understand if that's alarming and or upsetting for, for anybody. I will try to meet myself as quickly as possible if that happens. Um, I should say who I am, though. Um, so I'm Lindsay Vreeland. Um, I am coming um, to you from the Center of Innovative Teaching and Learning. I am one of the inclusive teaching coordinators. Um, but my previous, in my previous life, aka a couple months ago, I was teaching for uh, CSWGS, teaching um, women, gender, and sexuality studies courses. And I was also teaching for the English department, primarily first year composition, but I was also a coordinator for the writer's workshop over there, um, which supports uh, chance students, but also students that are coming in with lower GPAs into the first year writing courses. Um, so let's see, clinical fac faculty, our education, allied health and communicative disorders, CSWGS, special and early education, Love that. I'm so happy that we have a wide variety of people coming in. I'm going to create some space where we can um, talk a little bit about what we're already doing, because I know that some of you are already doing some of this stuff and that you're coming in with either as a neurodiverse learner yourself or experience uh, with neurodiverse learners. And you're doing cool things that I probably haven't mentioned. And it's worth you sharing that with everybody, too. Okay, so this presentation is recorded. Uh, we upload these uh, presentations on the CIDL YouTube. Uh, 
I've been told that some people watch them, um, but not many people outside of the university. Uh, just be aware of that. If there's a reason that you might want to ask a question that you wouldn't want to be um, recorded for, that's totally fine. I understand that. Um, and feel free to directly contact me after this. Um, I already said a little bit of this, uh, but again, I'm Lindsay. My pronouns are she, her, and um, I have contact information that you will all receive at the end of this presentation. So if you want to contact me directly and continue this conversation, want me to help you find resources, happy to do that. Love to do that. So for this workshop, we're going to hopefully by the end of this workshop be able to recognize that there's a broad range of neurodivergent conditions that create various needs amongst learners. Um, we're going to hopefully develop some strategies to support students and foster positive learning experiences for, uh, for our students regardless of their needs. Um, and learn ways to create courses with accessibility built into them where neurodivergent students can advocate for their needs, can identify, I would actually like it this way instead of this way, um, because you're presenting those options. And even if it takes you, you know, an hour to, to do that for them, they know that that's an option that you're willing to put that effort in um, if you haven't already built that thing into the course. I want to say that it takes time to take your materials and change them. It takes time to change assignment sheets. It takes time to, just like the actual sheet, it takes time. Not, um, and I mean, additional like time spent uh, reconfiguring an assignment, figuring out a different unit, figuring out uh how one thing works better than another thing um, in class activities, that takes time and effort. So um, realistically, if we can change one thing next semester, because we're pretty far into the semester, we can't necessarily like switch up our syllabus and all of our assignments and whatnot. Um, but if we can switch one thing up in next semester, uh, that's a reasonable ask. Um, especially when we have winter break that we're hopefully, you know, actually breaking during and um, not spending a bunch of time focusing on what things are to come because we also deserve breaks too. Um, okay. So I wanna talk a little bit about uh, neurodiversity. Um, we're not going to go into a ton of depth, but a lot of uh, a lot of things go into what we call like neurodiversity. So essentially, we're we're thinking about brains and behaviors and mental health conditions that uh, the people can experience, and we're noticing that. Uh, these these brains and these behaviors and conditions are existing outside of uh, what we have considered to be the norm in the past. And I want to acknowledge that the norm is uh, is constantly changing and that if we're able to sort of like group identities in a way that we can understand them, that people exist out of these categories and uh you know, trying to classify and categorize things hurts people, but also it helps us understand things. So it's like a, it's a double-edged sword. Um, but there's a lot of things that uh, go under this classification of neurodiversity um, and they can impact the way that people communicate, the way that they learn, the way that they think, the way that they behave. Um, and sometimes they coincide with disability but it's not necessarily something that is a disability. Um, and it's not a bad thing. I think that a lot of times we think about uh, neurodiversity and disability as being not optimal um, instead of just being a way that somebody is being. Um, and so if we are 
bringing an energy into the classroom of this is just the way that your brain works. Let's work with the way that your brain works. Um, that energy is going to be well met. And some people aren't going to have a diagnosis of being neurodivergent, uh, but they might prefer something different. And we don't necessarily need to have that diagnosis in order to understand like, oh, this is what you need. Let's bring that in. So there has been a rise um, in people that are diagnosed as being neurodivergent recently. Um, so 15 to 20% of, of uh, people have been um, identified as neurodivergent, I should say. Um, and those numbers have been on the rise since the pandemic. Uh, but certainly within the last decade, we're seeing things continuing to rise. Um, and that's for a variety of reasons. There's less stigma about claiming that identity, getting that diagnosis, uh, less idea of that we need to mask these conditions um, instead of just work with the way that our brain is working or um, claim that in, in learning spaces. Um, there are a lot of people who have been considered to be high functioning or high performing while having um, a neurodivergent brain. And so they're, um, they've been considered to be like, oh, you're a high performing person. Um, your hyper fixation is, is amazing. We love that. Instead of recognizing that that might be uh, something that's also hurting them in other aspects of their lives. Um, there's a greater awareness of, of behaviors, what that looks like. Uh, since COVID, there's been just an increase of stress and a break in routine, which has had a lot of people who need that routine and need that stability. It's caused a lot of people to sort of spiral um, and to readjust and to recognize things that are going on with them. Um, so not necessarily always a bad thing, but also it's just sort of like a... a here's this thing that's happening to your world. And also here's this thing that's happening to you. Sit with that um, alone in your house um, and talk with people over Zoom. Um, and there's been an increase of self-diagnosis too. Not everybody can um, afford to get a diagnosis that's official. Um, not everybody feels safe doing that. And so a lot of people are self-diagnosing and whether they are incorrectly diagnosing themselves, if something makes sense to them, if it like is fulfilling that need, why wouldn't we help them? And why wouldn't we recognize that that's, that's useful to them? I mentioned this a little bit before, but we will talk about good students sometimes. Um, and, you know, whether it's they're uh, high achieving in class or they're coming to office hours or um, emailing us, asking us questions, just showing um, dedication to our classes, uh, we need to sort of break down that idea of what we have uh, as being a good student or a bad student. Um, and again, people have been underdiagnosed because, especially in school, because we glorify and um, normalize neurodiversity when it shows up as dedication. So when people hyper fixate, um, if they have manic energy that they're able to put into their coursework, uh, if they have insomnia and they're working on their classwork, uh, yes, especially uh, especially fem people too. Um, and uh, which goes into like gender roles too and like the way that we're uh, trying to people please. Um, eagerness to please. She thought of it already, folks. Um, and this idea of perfectionism that you're always going to be on top of things, that you're not going to sleep because you need to get this thing done. And that's such a dedicated thing that, you know, Lindsay's doing. Um, and we also trivialize and dismiss uh, when students are prioritizing their well-being and uh, it impacts their productivity in our classes. So 
students choosing to sleep instead of doing their work. Um, sometimes we're like, well, that wasn't a good choice. Um, something was due at midnight. Why, why couldn't you have stayed up and done that? You have, you have an 8 a.m. class. That's plenty of time to sleep before that. Um, eating regular meals, choosing to go get food instead of come to your office hours or stay after and ask questions. Um, if they're choosing to spend time with their friends on the weekends or spend time with their family, um, take care of their of family members or relationships that are important to them. Um, if they're engaging in their hobbies, if they are doing the things that they're supposed to for athletics, um, like sticking to this workout routine or if they're choosing to work out. Uh, do things to clear their head, to make their body feel good um, instead of reading for your class or even, um, you know, engaging in music or other things that make us feel better. Uh, if they're choosing to do those things over your classwork, sometimes it comes across as, well, you're not dedicated to this class, um, which I also think that we should recognize that not everybody's going to be super, super dedicated to our classes all the time. I taught for steer composition for 12 years and it was generally not anybody's priority. It was a requirement. And so the focus on they're going to love my class and they're going to spend all their time on my class is just not realistic, Expect, especially when they have five other classes that they're just trying to get by in addition to their work, in addition to their relationships. Um. A lot of us have heard about spoon there or spoon theory, um, but I wanted to mention spoon theory and fork theory. So spoon theory often will be applied um, when talking about people that are disabled, but it's also applied sometimes to people that are neurodivergent. And it's this idea that everybody wakes up um, with, or oh, hopefully you're waking up. Um, maybe you didn't go to sleep and you got a number of spoons too. Um, but you start the day with a specific number of spoons. So this is a specific amount of energy that you can put into your tasks. And you're not going to be able to add more spoons throughout the day. You just have enough energy to do X, Y, Z things. Um, and so you can choose to uh, distribute those spoons as necessary. Usually it's going to be the urgent things that you're spending spoons on. Um, so for some people showering, just, you know, not even, um, a full shower as a lot of people like to call it, like washing your hair, um, and, and, uh, you know, doing skincare and all that stuff, just getting your body wet is one spoon. Um, for other people didn't even register for that. Um, so we have to recognize that some people have, uh, levels of energy and exhaustion where they're just trying to get by and do the necessary things that they can do to take care of themselves and also take care of like children or other animals, other important things in their lives. So this can um, coincide with neurodivergence, but fork theory is another way that we look at uh, people's brains and their energy and this is specifically applied to neurodivergent people. Um, and it comes from this idea of stick a fork in me, I'm done. Um, so you can only handle so many forks going into you a day. Uh, so this idea of every time a fork goes into you, it's you're being frustrated or overwhelmed and you have a limit. Um, so sometimes uh, there are days as, as a person who uh, is disabled and is neurodivergent um, and some of those things bleed over into one another. I might have three spoons a day and I can only handle three forks and we're, we're calling it a day. Um, and again, that's more of like an overwhelmed, like I'm done today. Uh, I, I can't handle anything else. Uh, so for some people, it might be the fact that their clothing is uncomfortable and that's a fork. Uh, it might be, I don't feel well. I have this level of pain today. That's a fork. I'm hungry and I have to sit through this three hour class. 
that's a fork. Um, and so it can be somebody blows up then after that. It could be somebody shuts down and they're getting away uh, from other people. Um, and so we have to recognize that sometimes people just have their limits with their energy, with their frustration, and it might not necessarily be a personal thing, but they might not be able to show up in class, whether they're physically there, uh, they might not be able to be mentally engaged. They might not emotionally be in a place where they can actively participate or deal with this other person who's putting a fork in them actively in class. So we can't change the number of spoons students come with uh, in our courses and we can't take out those forks for them. Um, there are some personal battles that they just have to deal with. Um, but it is so, so important that we create structure in our classes and we create grace in our classes where, uh, oh, I just saw the chat. Yes, overstimulation is is a big part of the of the forks, right? And just wanting to sort of like get away from all the simulation or yell at the simulation. Um, and I think that, you know, hopefully we're not yelling actively at people, but also, it boils up and um in in ways that are um that can be big but also if you understand if you're in that body it like something has to give um but creating uh schedules where students know what's coming in class like having a regular uh we're going to do this at the top of class for 10 minutes we're going to recap everything at the end of class. I'll tell you what assignments are coming up. Um, if we're making sure things are scaffolded um, in our class, if we aren't punishing them for making mistakes, um, if we're not treating them as being lazy or scamming when they need extra time on stuff, if they make a mistake, they forgot to cite something, um, students are more likely to be successful and to be able to manage the workload. Um, and again, this applies to all students. It's not just the ones that are neurodivergent. Sometimes you're just exhausted. Sometimes you're just pushed to your limit. Um, and so everybody benefits from these things. Um, so I've broken this down into uh, three ways to really support students. So looking at assignments and assessments, <coughs> Excuse me, one second. Hmm. Okay, sorry about that. Looking at assignments and assessments, looking at policies and management of our classrooms and looking at the way that we're communicating. So assignments and assessments, um, as I said, share your schedule, have this uh, understanding, let students know when things are coming up. Uh, I do not recommend doing pop quizzes. I don't recommend putting, doing pop presentations. Okay, you just learned about that. Lindsay, tell the class how that works. Uh, that makes me sweat so bad. Um, just hearing when students are like, oh, I had to do this in class. And I'm like, I have secondhand anxiety for you. Um, that's, I, I don't like that. Um, if you're going to do something to gauge understanding, letting them know at the beginning of class, hey, we're going to do this and it's, we're not going to grade. Oh yeah, I don't like reading out loud. I don't like reading out loud. Um, and again, like I, I've got a PhD in English. Like I'm used to reading. I don't like doing it out loud. Um, if you have a predictable schedule, if you're saying this is what we're going to do for the day, if something's going to change in your schedule, say, oh, remember, we're going to watch that video on Wednesday. Oh, remember, we're doing one-on-one -on -one conferences. Um, and this is what you need to do to prepare for that. Uh, 
show up as you are or show up with that draft or whatever it is uh, to make that a little bit easier. Um, if you can't meet a student's request, explain why. Uh, at the end of the semester, I can't grant many extensions because the university requires me to have grading done. And I tell students that. I say, hey, you know how I give you extensions and I'm willing to work with you and I tell you to get sleep? I also have to get sleep. I also have to eat. I have to walk my dog. She poops outside. Like there are different things. I, I deserve to be able to wash my hair. Like I can't be doing grading constantly um, the weekend before grades are due. So this is why I need this done. Um, and then I'll tell them to turn in what they've completed because I'll give them points for what they completed. And we can, we have those conversations a lot. Um, explain why these deadlines exist. Oh, I need you to complete this task before we move on to this thing. Um, so if you're not ready to turn in that draft, uh, you know, let's, I'll give you two days extension, but we really need, to, this is important for this next step. And so turn in what you have, let's talk about it. Let's meet one-on-one -on -one and figure out maybe what, what's missing from that draft, why, why it's not connecting with you right now. Um, and just like, let them know what the university expects of you, what the department expects of you. Um, if there are some things that are required from your courses because they're, uh, you know, gen eds that you don't necessarily love. It's okay to be like, hey, you, you know, like I'm required to teach you APA and MLA. I don't love this, but like, let's make it as easy as possible. Um, and create opportunities for additional support. So if you are, uh, in a class where study groups, reading groups, writing groups might be beneficial, encourage students to create those things. And maybe you attend too. Um, maybe there's an hour where you all meet in the library in a specific room and you can engage in that process also um, if they want you to. Maybe sometimes they don't. Maybe you meet outside, maybe you're outside of the room and then if they have questions, you can pop your head in. Um, there's a lot of students that, especially uh, before the pandemic, but since the pandemic, really, really like um, body doubling. So they really enjoy coming into my office and working. And I'll just work on my thing and they work on their thing. And they're like, well, I might have questions. And they never have questions. They just need a space where they can get work done, um, where they feel like they're being supported. Um, and that can be in online spaces too. Um, when you are thinking about assignments, giving students options, if they're able to incorporate something that they're super, super interested in, if it's an element of education that they're writing a research paper on, can they choose that element or are you giving them the element? Can they focus on something specifically within that? Um, having a lot of conversations around that is really, really helpful instead of like, oh, here's the thing, go do it, right? Um, as much as possible if you can start having a conversation. Um, and then also allowing students to choose the medium. So uh, a lot of students uh, say that they're bad writers, which is just not true. They've just not been supported, but also sometimes it's hard for them to sit down and write. So um, if they're supposed to be doing an interview paper, can you do an interview podcast instead and then write a reflection about it? So I still get you to write, but you're doing it in a format that feels more familiar and comfortable to you. Um, if you can do a PSA video instead of a speech, if they're, uh, worried about delivering a speech in class, can they record one beforehand and then show the class that, um, a big thing that I do that's helped me in addition to my students is introducing and normalizing tools, tech, apps, and methods for accomplishing goals. So showing them how to use organizational tools, uh, showing students the read aloud functions on Office. And that's huge 
uh, so many students are like, well, I, you know, like I had students that have like dyslexia, but also they just have anxiety about reading their own writing. Um, and so using the read aloud tool is really, really helpful. Um, there are also programs like Natural Reader that will help you with eBooks, but you can also use for PDFs, you can use um, for just random articles, Word documents, um, there's a free version and then there's a paid version. And I uh, introduced that to somebody early in the semester and she came back and said to me, all my students say that the paid version is worth it because they have a hard time sitting down and reading a 20 page article. If they can listen to it when they go take a walk, if they can listen to it um, while they're doing dishes or even when they're eating a meal, it's easier for their brain to intake that information because, you know, maybe their mind wanders when they're looking at the page or they're just exhausted. Their, their eyes are tired after looking at devices all day. Um, using organizational apps, uh, the task option through office is something I use regularly. Um, I have uh, my office calendar set up because I, I need to, I need to know what's going on. But I also have a separate Google calendar that lets me know where I'm supposed to be, when I'm supposed to be, and has like little deadlines that will pop up my phone, um, which is separate from office because I, you know, somebody can still schedule an appointment with me, but I want to know like what's going on, what's, what's my plan for the day. Um, using Evernote, Todoist, Bear, Brain Focus, those are all apps that help you organize your um, your day. And sometimes it's hard to get that started, but sh like, oh, I don't know how to do that either. Let's sit down and let's figure it out. I'll put it on my device. You put it on your device. And uh, having that sort of like, we're in this together attitude is really, really helpful instead of just throwing a bunch of app names at students and like, bye, see you next week. Uh, hope you get your life figured out. Um, it, they're, they're never going to do it, right? It's, it's just not going to happen. reading while listening. Yes. And that's, that's the thing too. You can, um, with some of these read aloud apps, you, you can look at the document while you're listening to it and it helps you engage with it in a different way. You can still do highlights. You can still do notes and everything. Um, but it, it, it logs into your brain in a different way. That's, uh, really, really interesting. And I'm sure there's a, like a lot of studies about it, but I didn't read them. Um, but I know they exist. I'll help you find them if you want them after this presentation. Showing students how to create folders with names and labeled documents seems like such a basic, basic thing. Um, but how many times have we received documents for assignments that are doc 89? And it's it's like, do you know that's your final? Do you know like that? How, how are you organizing stuff? This was from your from your comms class and you turned it in to me. Um, do we have separate folders to organize things? How are we How are we thinking about this? Where are our assignment sheets going if we're downloading them from our computer? And helping them set that stuff up uh, is really helpful. You can even do it on the computer in class, right? You can show them like, this is where my stuff goes when I create folders and show them how that works for you. Um, and then also just like physically using lists. Uh, I have a bunch of different methods that I use to organize stuff, uh, but I also love a hand um, made list. I like checking things off and feeling accomplished. I like putting post-it notes on my doors. So I remember like basic things, like I have to go get gas in my car. Um, and I won't remember that if there's not a post-it note and just normalizing that, normalizing that writing on mirrors or putting a post-it note on your computer that's okay. Uh, I think that there's a lot of embarrassment over that and we just got to normalize it. We just got to make sure that students like, no, you can't remember everything all the time. Um, especially when you're switching up the things that you're doing constantly throughout the day. Uh, in addition to all the other things that you're doing to exist and live as a person. So, um, if we can show them that these, these things are okay, um, and possibly even show them how to do that, uh, that's super, super helpful.
If you don't want to do it yourself, find the YouTube video that shows them how to do it and watch that with them or send it to them. Um, demonstrating kindness and care it seems pretty basic, uh, but uh, one of the major things that I do is not creating or enforcing deadlines that prevent students from sleeping. It seems maybe like silly, but um, I have so many students that come in and they're like, oh, I didn't sleep last night or, oh, I did this or whatever. And I'm like, should you be here? <laughs> should you be here right now? Were you safe to drive to campus? Did you eat? Have you had water? Can I go get you water? Like, if you're not sleeping, you're probably not doing other basic things that your body is requiring in order to keep you moving. And also, you might not be safe to yourself or other people around you. Um, so I tell students from the get-go, if you're not sleeping, you're not turning things in for me. You need to sleep. Um, even if it's a four-hour nap, do that. We'll talk after. Um, after 24 hours, students have, well, people in general, have a higher rate of error, unstable moods, and impaired judgment. So if you're not sleeping for 24 hours, you shouldn't be driving. Uh, after 72 hours, you can go into a state of psychosis and you need to be hospitalized. I tell students that because I think that it's important for them to recognize that this is serious. Sleep is a part, an important part of us being able to uh, regain spoons, take out forks, but also just to exist in a, in a like regular world. Oh, I love that, Kimberly. I just saw that comment. That's such a great way of, of, uh, of sharing information and also having other people endorse it. Um, so we need to sleep. I need to sleep. I'm happy to uh, let students take mental health days. Some people don't believe in that. Um, I don't even call them mental health days, though, honestly. If you can't be here, you can't be here. Um, you don't need to tell me that, you know, you had uh, this thing happen or that thing happen. If you can't show up, cool. Let's talk when you can show up. Um, creating opportunities for mistake, mistakes and growth. Uh, normalizing and demonstrating appreciation for questions. Um, so many people have been shot down when they, they want to talk about things in class. Um, especially neurodivergent people that are like, wait, back, back, back up. What is a thesis statement? Um, and we're writing a persuasive paper. So what's a thesis statement? And maybe it's just a refresher. Maybe it's they don't understand within the context. Uh, but if they're made to feel silly, they're not going to ask questions again. If it's something that you ex explained five minutes ago, um, I appreciate you asking for clarity. Yeah, this is where this is. If students ask you for something that's in the syllabus, I used to get so annoyed with that and say, it's in the syllabus. But now I say, oh, here's its information. It's in the syllabus. This is where you can find it. And I'll send another copy of the syllabus along with that um, and say, oh, this is the other information that goes along with it. You might want it. And just normalize like, oh, hey, you have a bunch of syllabi that you're looking at. Like you can't remember everything for every class and navigating everybody's blackboard is different. Navigating everybody's syllabus is different. So I just sort of like, will show them where to find the information in the future, but I am happy they're asking the question. They're asking the question. It means that they care. So like, let's get them to that point first, right? Um, offering varied instruction and multiple options for learning. So there's been a lot of debunking this idea of, oh, I'm a visual learner. Oh, I'm a, I'm a person that uh, learns better by via audio or whatever. Um, there's there's been a, like a big discussion in the education world of like, that's not like a real thing. Um, what's real is that we need to vary types of instruction. So maybe this thing solidifies it a little bit more for you. 
in these circumstances, but we need to vary the ways that we're doing stuff. So if it's a PowerPoint and talking through things, if it's an activity in class, if it's um, sending out YouTube videos after class to further the conversation about um, what a thesis statement is or what a persuasive paper is. Um, so if we can vary that information in as many ways as possible so that if it didn't latch on the first time, maybe it solidified the second time. And for the people that it did latch on, great. They have a better base. Um, and just normalizing that it's okay to ask for things in a different way. Should we do another activity? Should we uh, outline another paper on the board? What would work best for you? Um, thinking about uh, tests, I don't give tests. Um, I am against them. Um, I've been a TA in classes that did give tests. They gave me anxiety sitting in that room. I would sweat so bad thinking about, I can't memorize this information myself and I help teach it. How are these people supposed to memorize this information and is it doing them any good? Um, so if we're giving tests, does it matter if it's a closed book test? Uh, is the time limit vital for those of us that have great test anxiety? Um, is it cool if we do three hours instead of one hour? Um, are, are we thinking that not having the book open is going to solidify that information? Or are we think, you know, or could it be that having an open book allows people to find that information within the book and then contextualize it and think about it in a different way? Um, also maybe being able to retake tests. Uh, to recognize that, oh, this thing didn't, didn't click with me initially. Let me go back, think about that more and retake that aspect of the test. Um, creating checklists of skills uh, or genres, not just assignments. So thinking about what specifically are we trying to accomplish in this assignment um, and making sure students know that that's what you're focusing on and creating rubrics and classes that are scaffolded in order to support that. Um, not creating holes that students can't dig out of. So you missed the first essay. Well, that was half of the grade for the class. So sorry, it sucks to suck. Like what, what does that attitude do for anybody? Um, giving students the opportunity to revise, retake things. Um, maybe they can do smaller things to just get them out of that zero hole um, or using no zero grading. So student didn't turn something in. Um, hopefully it's not worth 50% of the class. That would be another conversation. Um, I might wanna have with you if that's what's going on, but uh, giving them 50% of those points because that's still an F, but it's not creating this crater where they're like, oh, cool, I'm in this class past the, the withdrawal date and I can't pass. I'm gonna have to retake. This is going to uh, affect my GPA. It's gonna affect my path forward in this class. If they can do something else to demonstrate that they understand the content, then like, let's think about that. Yes, and a term, is a term of assignments that are with, worth so many points. That's, yeah. Um, I've, I've had students talk to me about, oh, this is worth 70% of my grade. And I'm like, what were you doing the other 15 weeks of class then? What is going on? Um, but, you know, um, and not shaming students. If they didn't make, uh, meet requirements if they didn't, if they're missing work, if they give the wrong answer, sometimes there's only one right answer, right? And and if they gave the wrong answer, not shaming them. Um, figuring out, okay, where did we go off and how do we get back here? Um, talking through solutions and, and uh, redoing those uh, lessons together is, is super, super helpful because learning is about making mistakes and figuring out things. They don't just automatically have all the information because you said at the beginning of class. Um, 
policies and class management. Uh, this is something that I'm very, very uh, passionate about. Um, I think that students should be able to move in class. They should be able to eat and drink and fidget. Uh, some classes that's not safe, right? If you're in a chemistry class and there's chemicals around, if you're in a class that has technology and it's not safe for them to be eating and drinking um, with computers or whatever, I 100% understand that. Um, tell them where that can happen. Um, it's important that they eat and drink and get to be humans, but also sometimes you have that energy and or your, your uh, chair feels bad, uh, your, your back hurts, whatever it is, give them an opportunity to move around. Um, it can, might help them concentrate. It might help them regulate. Sometimes it's distracting to others. So tell them, oh, great, we're in this space. If you want to move around and stretch and stuff, along this corner is the best place to do that. Um, allowing them to use fidgets in class. Um, a lot of people have been complaining to me recently that students are just on their phones all the time and they're not even doing anything. They just have their phones in their hands. It's become this like thing for so many of us. We just want our hands on something. Um, so if you can bring your own fidgets to class, uh, I've seen people uh, saying that they use pipe cleaners where students can just like, everybody gets a pipe cleaner at the end in class and you get just a, it's a low budget way of getting them to have something to interact with. And it keeps their hands off their phones. It keeps their hands off clicking pens and pencils and things that might irk other people. Um, I haven't tried the pipe cleaner thing yet. I want to. I honestly think it's going to be uh, revolutionary. Um, and giving them opportunities to work and connect with other people. Uh, but also, if the class is really loud, it's easy to become overstimulated. I've been in so many um, meetings where we're like, okay, great, break up. And all of you are going to think about how we can do that research assignment. And 50 of us are going to be in this room. And it's so loud. It's so overstimulating. I can't think. And my brain turns into mush. And so recognizing that that might happen for students and there might be spaces outside of the room where they could go, there are possibly other opportunities for um, students to still work together, but also create an environment that is comfortable. Um, let's see where, okay, yeah. Um, I want to make sure that I have enough time to get through stuff, but, uh, so I'll move a little bit quicker, uh, but, um, Again, this seems basic, but like letting students talk. Again, um, there are so many students that feel uncomfortable because they've been told that they're distracting the class, that they're leading us off topic, that they talk all the time, that they're dominating um, conversations. And there is a possibility where someone might be talking a lot and not allowing other voices to come through. Um, but there's a way to acknowledge, like, I'm so glad you have such great ideas and that you're so, like, you're making all these connections, Lindsay. I want to make sure everybody else gets a chance to talk a little bit. Can we have this conversation after class? I really want to hear what you have to say. And just like validating and being like, I would like to have a conversation with you about this. I want to hear your ideas more. Um, or can you send me an email about that? Students love sending me emails during class. It's, it's wild, uh, but they're so used to, I think, like messaging people and um, they like to do it during class. And I, I am all for it because we can then have conversations in spaces that they feel more comfortable after class. Love it. Um, and if they're going off topic, can we bring them back around to topic and, uh, Acknowledge that there's connections going on that maybe you're not. It's it's not firing in your brain, but it is in their brain. 
um, not assuming that they're trying to get us off topic so that we don't have to do work today or whatever that is. Um, letting students be themselves. Um, there's this big thing in teaching, this idea that we're supposed to have the power, that we're supposed to be in control. Um, and a lot of that feeds our egos. And uh, so something that I'm forever working on, forever working on is, is setting my ego aside and realizing that students don't have to behave a specific way to be in my classroom and that they still deserve to feel like they are doing the things when they're, when they're still showing up. Right. So, uh, you don't have to be, um, be like a perfect student, a good student in order to deserve my attention, in order to deserve my praise, in order for me to be willing to help you or respect you. You do not have to earn respect. You are showing up and I'm going to respect you. I saw you talking to your friend earlier when I was talking about something. I'm still going to answer all of your questions because I don't know what was going on there. Maybe they were filling you in on something too. Maybe we're all in this community just trying to figure things out together. Um, creating space. If students need to put in headphones and listen to music um, during quiet work, love that. Some students like to have one headphone in like when they're doing small group work too. Cool. Um, as long as they're able to get this stuff done. I don't have a problem with it. Um, especially like I would say that for test taking too. I know that people that's a controversial thing, but um, if it helps them calm down and get into the space that they need to be, uh, I don't see why there would be a reason that we couldn't um, have them listen to music. Of course, it shouldn't be bleeding out into other people's spaces too. Um, and all this to say that disruptive and mean behavior shouldn't like not be addressed. Like we have to acknowledge that that sometimes happens. Um, again, if you are overstimulated, it, your frustration might come out in, in ways that um, hurt other people's feelings, feel very disruptive and feel very um, upsetting to other people. But we can go back and address that um, when, when everybody is in the headspace to do that. And we can use especially gentle uh, communication tactics. We see this a lot with like gentle parenting, but it's communication tactics for, for all ages. I use them on my parents all the time um, to be like, oh, what were you thinking when you said that thing? Like, what was that? Were you angry? You know, whatever. And it doesn't, it's not condescending. It's just trying to figure out what's going on and if we can build this relationship and understanding between each other. I love that. You raise your hand too. I I really like that. I think that's so clever, especially if there's like a very big class and there needs to be some sort of like order if you can't sit in a circle. Like I I think that's a really smart way of like um managing class and also demonstrating that you are going to follow these rules too. Um Communication and being open to students contacting you in various ways at various times. Is it maybe not your favorite to receive an email two minutes before something's due? Sure. But be willing to have that conversation. Maybe you don't answer it right back. Um, and that's another ego thing too. If you are upset about something, don't answer it when you're upset. Have time to sit on it. Think about it. Um. And make sure that you're talking through tasks. This is what we're going to do this time. This is what to do for next class. Make sure we're doing this reading because students sometimes, if they're not told, they're not necessarily going to look at a schedule that you created. If it's not on their personal schedule, they're not thinking about it. Um, we're running out of time, but I also want to say that um, this has been said to me like a million years ago when I was very frustrated with a student. And um, one of my mentors said, will you ever regret kindness? 
um, and not assuming the worst about somebody. And that really stuck with me. And so that's something that I like actively do. Again, setting aside my ego. Am I ever going to regret kindness? Am I ever going to regret trying to nurture that relationship, trying to get that communication going? Um, because I would hope that if I was in the same situation, other people would do that for me. Um, we've already had <laughs> Jack asked for positives and you don't have to be one. That's other, that, that's also very helpful. <laughs> um, we don't have a ton of time for questions and for sharing our experiences, but I appreciate all the experiences and, and suggestions that have actually been shared in the chat so far. Are there any questions that I can help answer right now? Or other suggestions that you want to pop in the chat? Thank you. I appreciate be, you being here. Okay. I've got uh, a couple last minute things to say. If you got to pop out, you got to pop out. I respect your time. Um, so I will be sending an email after this with all of my sources, all the information um, so that we can continue this conversation in other spaces too. Um, essentially, don't make neurodiverse students feel like a burden. Um, they have needs. Everybody has needs. It's not special needs. It's just needs. And if they're showing up into your classroom, they want to learn. And your job is to help them. So make sure that you're doing what you can to, to support them. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate you all showing up. I'm so glad we were able to have these conversations. Any other questions or concerns I can help answer?